Hello, welcome to our midweek service. Um, this will go out on July 15th. If you have your Bibles, we're going to be in Judges 21. We're going to finish Judges today. <clears throat> so we'll be in Judges 21 if you'll turn there. Um, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this time. I ask you to bless our study as we finish this book and we, uh, Lord, complete this thought process of Judges. I encourage us with these words in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so we're going to be finishing Judges today. And if, just as a review, we walk through this book, which basically talks about the cycle of sin. And we're seeing that cycle in our own nation, among our own individual lives. It's this idea of that people are walking with God, and as things are going well, they get lazy in their faith, lazy in their uh, morals, and they, they begin to drift away from God. In Israel's case, they would uh, enter into idol worship. God would bring an oppressor into their lives, which would cause them uh, to be under this oppression for years until they turned back to God. He would raise up a judge who would deliver them. For the last few chapters, we have been talking about this idea of not the judges, but the idea of what happens when there's no king in the land. And if you look at Judges 21, look at the very last verse of the book of Judges, it's verse 25. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. And this is why we haven't done this on purpose. We started Judges long before COVID, long before protests, long before talk of this election, long before man started just doing what was ever right in his own eyes. So it has been um, not purposefully, but it has really applied to our current situations, um, which helps us. We can learn a lot from it. And so... We have another thing that we just need to pray about. And, and we're going to look, look at verse one before we, I ask you for a prayer request. And uh, um, this lesson will be a little shorter, I hope, and a little more personal today. Got a lot of things on my mind um, that apply to this chapter. Verse, verse one of chapter 21 in Judges says, The men of Israel had sworn an oath at Mizpah saying, none of us shall give his daughter to Benjamin as a wife. So they made this vow. And this vow was a pretty simple vow. Um, we're not going to give any daughter to Benjamin. Well, why? Well, this is actually a continuation of chapter 20. And what I want to talk to you about today in this, this chapter is this idea of emotional responses and vows that you can't take back um when uh uh liz has a uh, my wife has we have this kind of running thing in our family if we're watching a movie or a film or something and the person in the movie you know maybe there was a daughter that was kidnapped and the police officer will say to the parents I'm going to get your daughter back, I promise. That always bothers her. We always kind of look at each other. It bothers me too, but um, it, it really irritates Liz. So we tease her a little bit about it. Whenever anybody says that, the whole family will look at her. Because you can't, you can't make that promise. You, can't, you don't know that you're going to. Well, if you read the script, I guess you know you're going to find that daughter. Uh, but in real life, you can't make those promises. Um, so we use phrases like, you know, Lord willing, um, or God, if, if it's God's will, I'll be there, that kind of thing. So we, we've talked about vows before in Ecclesiastes 3, if you want to really study, it has a lot to say about it. And basically, God says not to be rash with your mouth. So let's talk about this vow. Where does it come from? Well, it, it actually connects to chapter 20. And this is where the emotional part comes in. And what I want you to see is how the people of Israel were kind of baited into this emotional response. And we see that all the time 
your mind is being baited and manipulated emotionally. The heart is wicked, deceitful above all things. Well, let's see what happened. Back in uh, chapter 20, um, when the Levite was with his, went to get his wife, his concubine, they were traveling back home and stopped in a town called Gibeah. And if you remember in chapter 20, in Gibeah, men came banging on the door because of their immorality, wanting this Levite to be dragged out so that they could have their way with him. Um, the Levite um, immorally gave them his concubine and they uh, had their way with her all night until she died. Well, this man wanted revenge. He wanted revenge on the people of Gibeah and the tribe of Benjamin, because that's who was in occupying this town. So what he did is he cut this body of his concubine into 12 pieces and sent them out. Well, what I want to tell you is he did that to get an emotional response from Israel, to anger them. And we see that whether it's from uh, the left who wants uh, um, people to be angry at Donald Trump, so they'll say anything, or um, the other side who, who will bring up horrible things about the left, so the right can be righteously angered. And, and But what we see is that that emotional anger, that emotional response often leads us to sin, whether it's, uh, you know, peaceful protests that lead to riots, or you see this video, then you get so angry that you want to now defund or hate the police officers altogether because you've been riled up by the media to be angry at every police officer, or you've been riled <clears throat> by the media to be angry at the other side. So it, it goes both ways. So if, if you look at Judges 20, verse 13, um, it says, therefore, deliver up the men, that perverted men who are in Gibeah, that we may put them to death and remove the evil from Israel. So the initial response of the Israelites was not to wipe out Gibeah or wipe out Benjamin. Chapter 20, they just wanted the men. But instead, verse 14 of chapter 20, the children of Benjamin gathered together from their cities to Gibeah to go battle against the children of Israel. So it was kind of Benjamin that again made the wrong decision. What they should have done is delivered the guilty. And we, we can't have all groups of people paying for the sins of a few. So at the end of the chapter, the, this body is sent out to anger everybody. And the emotional response in chapter 21 is that the men of Israel sworn an oath at Mizpah saying, none of us shall give his daughter to the Benjamin as a wife. So they just said, look at, we're going to, and if you go back <clears throat> to the last two verses of chapter 20, <clears throat> excuse me, the men of Israel turn back, uh, verse 47 of chapter 20, 600 men turned and fled toward the wilderness from the rock of Rimon, and they stayed at the rock of Rimon four months. So these are 600 Benjamites that escaped. The rest of the Benjamites are struck down in verse 48 of chapter 20. When we get to chapter 21, there's only 600 Benjamites left, 600 men. And the Israelites say, look, at, we're not going to give them our wives. We're so mad at these guys. We're so this. And so we're going to destroy them. We're, we're just, they'll, they'll fade away. We won't give them any wives and the Benjamites will be gone. So that was their rash decision. Look at verse two and three of chapter 21. The people came to the house of God and remained there before God till evening. They lifted up their voices and wept bitterly. They said, O Lord God of Israel, why has this come to pass in Israel that today there should be one tribe missing in Israel? So outside of God's presence, they make on their own this rash decision that they are not going to give any wise to the Benjamites, <clears throat> which will wipe out the Benjamin tribe. Verse two and three, they go to church. 
remain with God till evening, and they realize, well, that wasn't the good, the right thing to do, because now this tribe, these 12 tribes of Israel that God ordained, they're going to be short a tribe. The Benjamites are going to be gone, and they do what human nature does. Verse 3, why, Lord, why? Why is this happening? It happens all the time. People fall into sin, their life falls apart, and they turn to God and ask him why. Oh, God, why am I in this mess? Why am I in this trouble and travail? When they didn't follow God's directions in the first place. And so they make this emotional vow. So that's what I want to talk about today is the idea of the consequences of acting too rashly. And there are a ton of verses on this subject. Um, we're going to look at some verses from Proverbs. I'm going to start in Proverbs 18. If you want to turn there, you can. Um, so the Bible says to be quick to hear and slow to speak. The Bible all the way through has verses and principles of just waiting before you react and respond. What we see is a, is a culture now that responds, you know, this cancel culture and everything. And we, we respond before we get the facts. We see a, a, a little snippet of a video without knowing the whole story. And we can respond incorrectly. Well, here's what the Bible says. Proverbs 18, 13. The first to plead his case seems right. Isn't that amazing? Look at verse, this is, uh, I'm sorry, Proverbs 18, 13. He who gives an answer before he hears, it is folly and shame to him. God addresses it right there. If you give an answer before you know the whole thing and deem something, and we see this sometimes in some of these videos in which we don't see the whole story. Um, verse, uh, chapter 18, verse 17, that's when I started reading. The first to plead his case seems right until another comes and examines it. So uh, the first one to the keyboard and, and types it in seems right. Well, let's wait. Be patient. Let's get the whole story. Let's find out exactly what happens before we uh, protest, riot, respond. Proverbs 29, 20. Do you see a man who is hasty in his words? There is more hope for a fool than him. Proverbs 20, 25. It is a trap for a man to say rashly, it is holy, after the vows to, after the vows to make inquiry. In other words, that verse is talking about when we deem something as from God, when we don't really know that it is yet. Uh, there's a verse in Timothy about not laying hands on someone as a minist in ministry too rashly. Give time, wait. Um, Proverbs 21, 5. The plans of the diligent lead surely to advantage, but everyone who is hasty comes to poverty. Usually those things that are too good to be true, get rich quick schemes, they usually are too good to be true. Finally, now Ecclesiastes 5.12, do not be hasty in word or impulsive in thought to bring up a matter in the presence of God, for God is in heaven and you are on earth. Therefore, let your words be few. Um, I've been very cautious about preaching on why the world is doing what it's doing. Um, I've heard a lot of people say, well, it's the, it's the end times. This is it. The Lord's coming back. Maybe, maybe 100 years from now, maybe 100 minutes from now. I don't know. Uh, but what we do know is that God is the author and finisher of everything. God's in control, and we need to trust him. Um, but it's hard uh, sometimes when we see things spinning out of control. So they make this rash decision. And, and when you make a rash decision, you kind of get caught up in your own judgment once you've said something. Um, so what are they going to do? Well, they've realized in church that they've made a mistake. 
So if you as a Christian have made a mistake due to an emotional rash decision, what should you do? Repent, turn, admit, confess, ask God to forgive you and, and see if he'll forgive this foolish rash vow. It's not what Israel does. Look at verse four. So the next morning, the people rose early, built an altar. Well, they're starting okay. They offered burnt offerings and peace offerings. The children of Israel, verse 5, said, Who was there among all the tribes who did not come for the assembly of the Lord? For they made a great oath concerning anyone who had not come up to the Lord at Mizpah, saying, He shall surely be put to death. So in verse 5, they remember they made another foolish vow which is anybody doesn't come help us, we're going to put you to death. So the children of Israel grieved for Benjamin, their brother, and said, one tribe is cut off from Israel today. What shall we do for wives for those who remain? Seeing we've sworn by the Lord that we will not give them our daughters as wives. What are we going to do? They're caught in their own emotional decision. We promised God we wouldn't give them our wives, our daughters, as to be their wives, and now the tribe's going to be wiped out. So verse 8 says, what is one, what one is there from the tribes of Israel who did not come to Mizpah to the Lord? In fact, no one came from Jabesh Gilead to assemble, for the people were counted, indeed not one from Jabesh Gilead was there, so the congregation sent 12,000 of their most valiant men, commanded them, saying, Go and strike the inhabitants of Jabez Gilead, including the women and children. Now we'll fix this. We'll just go wipe out an entire city of Jabez Gilead, because they didn't help us, including women and children. And this is the problem when people make rash decisions, um, innocent suffer. And this thing, you shall do, you shall utterly destroy every male, every woman who has not, who has known a man intimately. Verse 11, verse 12. So they found among the inhabitants of Jabez Gilead 400 young virgins who had not known a man intimately. They brought them to the camp at Shiloh, which is in the land of Canaan. So that was their new plan. We'll go to this Jabez Gilead. It's really not wrong, rationalizing sin, and we'll wipe them all out except for the women who were not known to a man and the virgins. And then we'll take them and give them as wives to Benjamin. That way we keep two promises, two bad promises at one time. Um, and innocent people are going to die because of these rationalized, sinful vows that they made. So verse 13, the whole congregation sent word to the children of Benjamin who are at the Rock of Remont and announced peace to them. Benjamin came back at that time. They gave them the women who had been saved alive and the woman of Jabez Gilead, yet they had not found enough for them. Uh, so remember, they found 400 wives. The problem is there's 600 Benjamites. So there's not enough. There are 200 brides short. Verse 17 says, there must be an inheritance for the survivors of Benjamin that a tribe may not be destroyed from Israel. However, we can't give them wives from our own daughters, for the children of Israel have sworn an oath, saying, Cursed is the one who gives a wife. Again, caught in their own rash decision, rash vow. Oh, there's 200 short. We can't give them ours. What are we going to do? So they come up with another great plan. Not a great plan. Now this plan is going to involve kidnapping. In verse 19, they said, In fact, there's a yearly feast north of Shiloh, in which is north of in Shiloh, north of Bethel, on the east side of the highway that goes up from Bethel to Shechem and south to uh, Libona. Therefore, they instructed the children of Benjamin, saying, Lie in wait in the vineyards. So here's what you're going to do. You're going to go lie in wait in the vineyards. Verse 21, watch. And when the daughters of Shiloh come to perform their dances, come out from the vineyards, Catch a wife for himself, kidnapper, from the daughters of Shiloh, and go to the land of Benjamin. 
Then it shall be when their fathers or their brothers come to us to complain, we will say to them, be kind to them for our sakes, because we did not take a wife from any of them in the war, for it is not as though you have given the women to them, making yourselves guilty of your oath. Well, this is a great plan. So you're going to go kidnap these women. And then when they come to us to complain, we'll say to them, hey, it's okay. They stole them. You didn't technically give them to them. They stole them from you. So you're basically free from your vow. So, so everybody wins, except the girls who were kidnapped and the sinfulness of the whole thing. Uh, we are seeing so much sin today that it's being rationalized. And, and there's compromise. And uh, if you listen to Sunday's message about the word um, being the ultimate right and wrong uh, decider, right and wrong judge is the word. And so we see this constant mess that they're in. And this is the thing that really we need to pray about. If, if we're not going to turn, well, let's look at the, the last part of this uh, chapter. Um, the children of Benjamin did so. They took wives, verse 23. And as they take these wives for their number that who danced whoever they caught, they went and returned to their inheritance and they rebuilt the cities. Verse 24, very important. So the children of Israel departed from there at that time, every man to his tribe and family. And they went out from there, every man to his inheritance. So this is the question. In Joshua 24, 26 through 28, Joshua's life is ending, and Israel is worshiping idols. And they are um, pleading with Joshua that they're going to follow God. So he sets up a stone and puts this vow, knowing they're probably not going to keep it. And the last thing he says to them in verse 28 of Joshua 24 is it says, so Joshua let the people depart, each one to his own inheritance. In other words, okay, you made this promise. Uh, you made this vow to God that you wouldn't turn to idols. I don't really trust you. But here's the beauty of it. In verse 24 of John, Judges 21, it ends with this idea that every man went to his own inheritance. And that's how it works today. This, 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 as this world just farther and farther and farther away from God, God works with you as an individual. You will um, inherit your either eternal life or you will inherit eternal torment. You will inherit the blessings of God or you will inherit the cursings of God. And it all depends on, on, on who you choose to follow. And so every man uh, will uh, be left to their own inheritance. That's a good thing for us because if we were going to stand before God to answer for the sins of the United States or the government or false teachers or this world, um, we would be in trouble. But you will stand before God and give an account for your personal uh, response and activities towards God. Which brings us to verse 25. In those days, there was no king in Israel, and everyone did what was right in his own eyes. That's America. Uh, the Bible says in Proverbs 12, 15, the way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but he who heeds counsel is wise. A fool says in his heart, there is no God. Proverbs 21, 2 says, the, every way of man is right in his own eyes, but the Lord weighs the hearts. So God sees your heart. He knows your personal ways. Proverbs 14, 12 says, there is a way that seems right to a man, but the end of that way is death. You're right if you follow Christ. There are men that think they're going the right way, but they're far from him. Their end is going to be death. Matthew 7, 13, 14 says, enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it, because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way that leads to life. And there are few who find it. 
So there is this idea of, of this two roads and understand the narrow road that few go on is the right way. So you too will um, absolutely go to your own inheritance, all depending on which road you take. While the world is drifting away from God, while the world is going crazy, while the world is doing everything and they all think they're right in their own eyes, we individually will give an account to God, which is a good thing for those of you who are following Christ at this time. Hang in there, hang in there. The world, yes, you can say it's going to hell in a handbasket and our country has fallen apart. All that is true, but you, you will stand before God and hear those words, well done, thou good and faithful servant, if you continue to follow him and do what he said. So that's this idea of rash. So don't get so emotional over everything that you lose sight of God and that we begin to say things and make decisions that uh, we can't take back. Take a breath, get the whole story, think about things, and then preach the word. Preach the word. Uh, so I've asked you to um, that I had a prayer request, and, and the reason why this applies is um, I'm emotional now, and as you know, that there's been uh, new mandates put out by our governor about meeting and my emotions tell me well i'm still meeting we're still having church and we're going to continue to have church if, if uh, protests are allowed then we're going to have church and that's all very emotional and uh i'm not sure I'm, as far as right this second um i'm not changing anything we'll continue to do our youtube messages um, and I plan to show up on Sunday morning at 10 o'clock and preach um, both online and live. Um, not sure how we're going to respond to that. Uh, but I don't want to do an emotional response. And I don't want to do the wrong thing because I, I'm, I'm flying by my emotions. Does that make sense to everybody? I hope it does. So if you just pray with us. I also don't want to um, disobey God. If he, if he wants us to continue to meet. Uh, my thing about it is as long as protesters gather, I think the, the worshipers should gather. Um, Heavenly Father, I just pray, Lord, that you would be with this lesson. It's a little more personal. Lord, because of that, maybe it was a little bit more erratic. But Lord, the message is simple. Uh, all of the horrible things that happened in these last three chapters happened because Every man did what was right in his own eyes. And that's what we see in our nation. And so those were, uh, who made this rash decision, they, they, didn't, they, they didn't realize it was wrong until they got with God in verse two and three. But then their responses to it wasn't repentance, it was more sin. Lord, I pray our nation would repent, turn from their wicked ways hear from God in heaven. In Jesus' name, we thank you and praise you. And Lord, we just ask you to direct our steps on what to do about our Sunday meetings. Help us to be obedient to you and you alone. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for listening. Have a great week. I'll see you Sunday and I will uh, be praying for you. Thank you.